We're here today to talk about Macabacus. We recommend anyone using a PC, particularly people working in finance, so private equity type roles, as well as FP&A, so heavy users of Excel, invest in a shortcut plugin. Macabacus is one of the easiest ones to get started with, and it's also affordable. So let's talk about how to get it set up. So what can we do with Macabacus? There's basically three things that I think are the killer features. There's plenty of other functionality in the tool as well. Number one, formatting shortcuts. They're easy to configure and easy to cycle through for quick color formatting, um, font style, centering, borders, and so on, things like that. Number two, you can step through a formula. So it's, it's called tracing precedence to step through all the component pieces of a formula, including across tabs. And then you can trace dependence, which is what is everything that this one cell drives in terms of other cells in my model. And then number three is you can export to PowerPoint or Word and then keep everything refreshed through a simple click the refresh button in PowerPoint or Word via the Macabacus tool, as opposed to you updated your model and now you need to repaste a bunch of pages for investment committee. Instead of all that repasting, you just go and hit refresh. So let's get into it in terms of how to get started. One of the great things about Macabacus is that keyboard shortcuts are very configurable. And once you configure them, you can basically export those settings. You can always re-import them later. I recommend once you get everything configured how you want it, definitely export your settings, save it somewhere that if your computer were to crash one day, you could re-import it to your next computer, no problem. Now, what that also means is that we have configured shortcuts how we think that they are most useful or usable. And we've made that available for anybody to download and import themselves. So if you've gone ahead and downloaded the recal configuration of Macabica shortcuts, go ahead and save that anywhere on your drive. That could be like on your desktop, for example. And then what you're going to do is go to the Macabicus tab. You'll see this so long as you've installed the Macabicus plugin. You can go to the Macabicus website and try a free trial or down, you know, download and pay for the plugin. And you'll see the Macabicus plugin in Excel. You can then go to settings, import, and then import from XML pull in that recalc, you know, select that recalc file wherever you saved it, and then you'll have the same settings as we have. If you do that, the rest of this will be very useful to you in terms of how to use our short, use the shortcuts as we've configured and then make any further configurations from there. Let's talk about keyboard configuration or keyboard shortcut configuration. There's basically two things to know. Number one, if we go to Macabacus settings, keyboard, shortcut manager, this will show us all the shortcuts as they exist today. Yours should look the same if you installed the recalc shortcuts. If you still have kind of the original factory setting, some of the some of the actual shortcuts might look a little bit different. You'll notice that every shortcut is a combination of Control, Alt, Shift, and another character. Not every shortcut uses all of those characters, but you can use any combination of those four. Whatever is shown in dark gray is what you're using. So in this case, the general number cycle as we have it set up is using Control, Shift, N. And if you should ever want to change any of these, simply click or unclick any of these. And on this last piece, you can select from any of the characters. It will warn you if you're trying to use something that is already used elsewhere, either in native Excel or in the Macabacus itself. Um, let's now see where do we go to um, understand the behavior of each of these shortcuts. So Macabacus settings configure brings up all of our configuration. This shows us all of the functionality, also lets us change any of it. You should not have to do this on a regular basis. This is just kind of a nice to know. So on the Excel front here, if we go, for example, to colors, we see the font colors are blue, green, purple, red, white, black. That means if you were to hit Control Shift C, we see that over here on the right hand side, font color cycle corresponds to Control Shift C. We would cycle through our font being blue, green, purple, red white, and then black. If you ever move off of a cell and come back to it, it will start again from the beginning. Should you choose to change any of these, you can click this edit icon, change and you know change any of the colors that you want. You can add or subtract any as well. Um, if you don't see a color that you're looking for on this palette, that is one kind of funky thing in Macabacus. You do have to set up the palette to have the colors you want. That's up here under color palettes. You can always create another palette. There's already one, the default one and the Recalc Academy one here. If you want to create another palette, you would simply hit the plus, name the palette, and then in Excel, lay out the colors that you want, like literally just fill them in, select those cells and hit import colors from Excel, and it will bring those into the palette. Pretty straightforward. Again, not something that you need to do ever like more than one time. And then if you already like the colors that we have set up, you never have to make any changes. If you get stuck on this, please don't hesitate to reach out because it's one of the trickier things. Under some of the other ones worth highlighting, so number cycles, um, 
Each of these number cycles in the upper right is found under this drop down here. So starting with the general number cycle, basically anything that you would find if you were to hit control one and look at custom number formats can be put here. And we can add or subtract to this list. So this is going to cycle through accounting, month, year, date, and then dollar sign. Let's say we wanted to add multiples to that. We could hit plus for another thing in the cycle. We can name it, let's say multiple. And then we can put any format again that you would find in custom number cycle. So 0.0x, for example, would give us a one digit multiple. If I hit OK at this point, it will warn me to uh, restart office. I usually don't need to do that. By the way, if you wanted to change where this came in the order, you could hit the plus, sorry, the up arrow or the down arrow, or if you don't want it anymore, you could get rid of it. Um, under styles, you can actually do custom combinations of things. So you could have something that underlines and centers and bolds, et cetera, all at once. You can, you have up to eight custom cycles to work with. We've already filled in the first few, although feel free to edit those. And then you can add more things to the cycle with the plus or get rid of anything with the minus. You can edit with this, edit the particular thing. Like if we want to edit this, we can edit this by hitting this edit style. We can see here, this one sets it to a month dash year formatting, single counting underline. Most of the rest of this is not changing, but there's a lot of different configurability here on most of the dimensions that you would want. And then finally publishing, this will change everything to black and white, our default font color, which in this case is black, gray, white. And um, that's very helpful if you have a model where you have blue for hard code, green for links, et cetera, and you want to paste into PowerPoint, you don't need to create a separate version that's pasteable. We'll automatically do that so long as you have this box checked. I'm going to hit OK. Again, it warns me I can just hit OK. I don't actually need to restart. I'm going to close out of the shortcut manager just because it does slow things down a bit to have it open. I just use it to reference if I've forgotten about something. So with that, let's turn our attention to the actual shortcuts that are, I would say, the most useful are the ones that you're gonna to want to know. Again, if you forget any of these, you can just open up that keyboard shortcut manager again. Okay, so what are the most useful shortcuts? Let's start with colors. I use Control Shift C to cycle through all of my color cycles, starting with blue, green. So I usually use blue for hard code, green for links, purple for a link off to another tab or a more complex or, or unique link, and then uh, red usually denotes there's some issue that I plan to come back to and then white, so the text here is not gone, it's just white, and then back to black. If I were partway through this cycle, let's say it was green and I moved off the cell and I came back, it's gonna start at the beginning, which is blue. If I want to just cycle blue, black, simply control semicolon does that. That's a little quicker. To fill in the cell is gonna be control shift V, this will cycle through blue, gray, uh, yellow, orange, uh, dark blue, and then back to no fill. And then we've built a few custom fill head fills that we use for headers very frequently. So control shift G does dark blue with white bolded text. If I type, let's say header here, that's all done already for us. If I had hit control shift G twice, that would give me light gray, regular text and borders on the top and bottom useful for putting uh, total lines at the top of data files sometimes. Let's talk about number cycles. This is accounting style formatting to begin with. If you're familiar with that, you'll know that that's a comma every three digits. Um, negative numbers are in parentheses. And then zero shows up with a dash. So zero as a dash, negative numbers in parens. So accounting style formatting, I do almost all the, on all my numbers. And then um, if we're looking more for date formatting, if I hit control shift N twice, it gives me month dash year. Again, is full date. Again, is with a dollar sign. And then back to the beginning. Percent, let's say I had you know something like 10%. If I hit Control Shift P, it will format it as a percent in italics with uh, one single decimal place. You could go to that drop down and find the percent cycle to edit that if you wanted to. If I have a number here and I hit Control Shift 8, that's going to give me a multiple format. And then finally, for any of these, if I want to show or hide more decimal places, Let's say I have some number here and I want to show more decimal places. Control shift left caret, which is next to the M, allows me to show more decimal places. Right caret would show fewer. Under alignment, I would recommend never merging cells. If you want to center across multiple cells, you center across selection. The way to do that, so control shift M, just hitting the M once gives us a centering in that one cell that's useful for just centering in individual cells. And then if I hit the M again with still holding control shift, it's centering across selection. 
Control shift U does single county under or does underlining. Um, hitting the U once gives you a regular underline. Hitting the U again gives you single accounting. That's most of the time what I use. If you kept going through that cycle, you would get double accounting. And then because I do this so often for headers, we actually went ahead and made a custom one. So if I just type header here, for example, control shift F centers across selection and does a single county underline all at once. If it's a date, let's say 12, 31, 2020, and I want that similar concept, control shift H centers it, got, gives a single county underline and makes it a date style format. For borders, there's a lot of options. I would suggest you consult the um, keyboard shortcut manager if you like to use a variety of different borders. I mostly use top borders. Control shift B gives me a single line. You do have to move off of it to see it. If I were to hit control shift B twice, it makes that line dotted. Control shift B three times means no top border. Same cycle, control, uh, but different key combinations for where you want the border. Control shift seven gives us an outer border again once, single, twice, dotted, and so on. On that topic, toggles can also be very useful. Control shift six once gives us like a regular number toggle as you might use if you're building out cases, for example. Control shift six twice gives us that as a percentage, often useful for showing like a tax rate or something similar in a model. And then finally, tracing precedence and dependence will be control shift left bracket and right bracket. Those keys are next to the P and we'll show those separate. So we're going to walk through tracing precedence and dependence quickly. Um, they basically let you step in the case of precedence through each piece of a formula or dive into the, you know, whatever the component pieces are in more detail. It includes lighting you step across tabs. So that's on the precedent side. Let's take a look at that. If I have some file, we have some file here, some ARR analysis, and we're trying to understand it. We do control shift left bracket. We see this formula is a sum if cutting across a couple of different tabs, or really the data tab and this tab. I can down arrow into it. It highlights the piece of my formula that it is in and brings me to that section. So it has brought us over to this data to tab and to the specific data in question on the right hand side here. We could scroll around if we needed to, but I, I understand, okay, we're adding that March quarter. And then if I hit the down arrow to the next piece, so long as the customer ID on that matches this customer ID over here on this tab. So that helps me step through and understand the formula. If I'm like, wait a second, where does that come from? We see this little right arrow here. That means we can step into that piece of the formula. I simply hit the right arrow key on my keyboard, and then that changes the formula shown at the top to be the formula of that cell. So that's the unique of some data on the other tab. I can step into that data and see what that is. I can left arrow back out of that if I'm happy enough with that, and I could keep going here. This is the end of our formula. So I can either go back to any previous piece I want to examine, or I can hit escape to be done there, and it will bring me back to the cell that I was tracing. So that's trace precedence. For trace dependence, trace dependence is a different concept. Trace dependence says, hey, what's what are all the things that this cell drives? For example, if I said, okay, does my total cell here drive anything? Look, I'm not sure. Was this just for a check or does this actually drive anything? I could hit the control shift right bracket, again, two keys over from the P on our keyboard, and then say, okay, this does drive a few things. What does this drive? And down arrow here, this drives what appears to be a check line, down arrow here, and this drives a couple of cells in my other tab. If I want to get into those in more detail, I can right arrow into that and say, okay, well, what is, you know, what is that doing? And what, what or what it really, what is that driving? We're tracing dependence. So this total cell also drives a few other things and so on. And then we can hit escape out of that to see, okay, I probably shouldn't delete that. That appears to be driving some things. So that's the other useful tool for auditing and tracing through your work. The other killer feature of Macabacus is that we can export from Excel to PowerPoint or Word. I typically do as a picture and then keep that easily refreshed and updated even if we make changes to the Excel file. So let's say that we have some output, some ARR analysis that we want to put into a slide. This is going to go into whatever slide we've most recently had open so long as the PowerPoint file itself is open. And I'm gonna say Macabacus export Excel as a picture to PowerPoint. You also can do as a picture to Word or any of these other choices. So I'm going to say as a picture to PowerPoint. And then I'm going to need to switch the screen share here so that we can see where it went. This just uh, went dropped into the slide that I had open. I can, you know, change the format or like the size of this as I could with any picture. And then I can go back to my Excel. Let's say I make some other model updates. I'm just going to make something that's simple and obvious. Let's say this is suddenly a much different and larger number. Then, and then we're going to see how do we update 
everything. So let's say this is a different number. I'm going to go back over to PowerPoint and now see how we can update this. So I have two choices. I can either update just this one analysis. Let's say maybe I'm in the middle of making changes to the rest of my model and I don't want to update all my model pages. Maybe I would want to right click this, go to Excel link and refresh just this one link. I'm not going to hit that just yet. Or I could go to refresh up here, select this drop down and say refresh all if I wanted to refresh all of my model pages in my deck. It's bringing up a quick um, progress bar and then it tells me that it's done. Those unfortunately don't come through in the screen share. And we can see all these numbers are different, but nothing around the, the sizing of this image changed, which is great. I don't have to repaste anything. If I ever open up a PowerPoint, I'm like, huh, where does this come from? I can always right click and say Excel link and go to view source. If your Excel file is open, it will just jump you to that file. Or you can edit the link if you want to change the file that it's linking to. You can break the link if you don't want it to be dependent on the Excel anymore. Um, if the file is not open, viewing source would just tell you the file path name. By the way, it is pretty good at recognizing versioning up. So if you version up the Excel file, it will say, do you want to link to that new version? It will give you a choice. That is it on exporting.